Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone to another live stream. I'm Rich Sheffrin. And while I'm getting ready here, I thought maybe I would just play one of my social proof videos as I'm getting organized and ready to start. So we'll do this quick two minute video and then we'll jump into ADD strategies that help entrepreneurs thrive, right? I, although that might not be the official title, that's what I'm gonna call it today. So uh, be back in two. It was a one-man show, a uh, closet warrior, as we say, and Rich gave me the courage to realize that I had a real business. And from there, I was able to go not from just a seven-figure business, but to an eight-figure business within the next two years. I went from making a five-figure income to a seven-figure income. And my blog went from 5,000 a month to 15,000 a month and then 20,000 a month. I believe we went from 1.3 million to 2.4 million within a year. We were fairly new in the business of doing internet marketing and we did not know what we did not know. The recession had just hit. I had lost half my business. You know, I just wasn't sure what to do at that point. The best way I could explain it would be if you had a dumpster fire and you would just pour more gas on the dumpster fire. Grabbing everything I could because I wanted to make money, but then at the end of the day, it wasn't serving my business. You individually need to do more. That's what I thought. I thought success was based on how hard you work, how many hours you work. Everybody else was just coming up with the tricks and the hacks. Here was this guy who brought not just practical digital online marketing wisdom, but he brought practical business with him. Everybody I knew was like, you need to know Rich. I'm like, Rich, who? I don't want to be Rich. Who Rich? This is the guru's guru. This dude teaches all the people that we're all reading from. You got to go to the guru to the gurus. This guy is the guru to the gurus. When you get inside kind of the inner circles, everybody knows who Rich is. Rich was the first person who really explained online marketing in a way that I really could understand and apply. It was like the light came on in a dark room and I saw, oh, I've, there's a whole layer to running a business I'd never thought about. Since the time that I started working with them, I've generated you know, millions and millions of dollars in revenue. More money started coming in. Then all of a sudden I'm producing products and coaching programs and building an audience that needs what I am good at. And I'm getting 5,000 bucks for my 12 week program. I'm getting 2,000 bucks for my four week program. But I, I wanna say this, that it's been about more than just the money. I feel like in many ways he gave me my life back. Besides being a guy who thinks strategically and thinks in terms of solution, Rich is, a good guy. And it's really refreshing to have somebody with his caliber of knowledge who you can tell really cares. It was freedom. That's the easiest way I could put it. It was freedom. A sense of freedom, a sense of hope and future where I could see a path to get to where I wanted to go that I wasn't going to get to on my own. Someone like Rich can really put worth in you that you're not seeing. Confidence. You know, in business, so much of our success depends on our own internal confidence. Having the confidence, knowing the fundamentals and, and understanding how the business moves. He works with people who are having your same problem. So he's able to show me someone like me. It's not just someone talking about hypotheticals. These are tried tactics that he's done year in, year out. I'm glad he's back around, you know, helping people. I'm excited he's coming out of retirement for this. It, that's a big deal. I can certainly recommend it. You know, without hesitation, I know that anything that comes out from Mitch Shepard is going to be top, top quality. Best coach, best mentor of my life. His main concern is making sure that he's delivering more than he promises in every project that he works on. It had a huge impact on my business, so I'm excited for all the people who will benefit from it this go round. I would just say do it before he goes back into the vault. I think that you will get just some immense value from working with him. Even better than he seems, which is rare on the internet. So there we go. And I was able to do all that even though I have ADD. So good thing to start. Let's say hello to everyone. If you've already said hello, then I'm going to say hello back to you in the comments. But if you haven't, please do say hello. It helps me know who I'm talking to as well as it helps uh, me with the algorithm gods of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and everywhere else. And so uh, if you're <clears throat> watching this on YouTube, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead, press the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, you know, emote and comment. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, <clears throat> we have a Facebook group called Strategic Profits. It's free to join. A lot of heavy hitters are in there. And I also share some of the paid material I have in there as well. So make sure to join. If you're on LinkedIn, connect with us. If you're on Instagram, please, um, I guess, follow us on Instagram. And uh, what we're talking about today are strategies for ADD, for ADD entrepreneurs. Um, <clears throat> I really got to clean my throat. Whoops, we're removing that. Um, because it's going to be annoying talking. There we go. Um, and how really, <clears throat> depending on how you 
uh, really leverage your ADD. It's either a huge disabling kind of like hanker around your neck or it's a superpower. And really, it can be a superpower. And, one of, and definitely, I want to talk to you about that today. Uh, in fact, while I haven't done as much research as I'd like, they are in my Evernote. And at some point, I will be doing the research. Um, there's a lot of correlations, in my opinion, when I look at flow and hyper-focusing. And if you have ADD, then you have the ability to hyper-focus. In fact, when I was first... Uh, told that I might have ADD, I thought it was the biggest joke that I ever heard because I tend to hyper-focus quite a bit. And so in that mode of hyper-focusing, uh, I tend to have more focus than anybody I know. And so when I first was told that I might have ADD and I was thinking about my ability to hyper-focus, I was like, well, I think you're wrong. I must not have ADD because I know how to focus better than anyone. Um, you know, I could just focus on a textbook for 48 hours, not at any time, but 48 hours before the final, I certainly could find, do it very easily when other people couldn't. And so that's part of the ADD mind is that when there's either passion or adrenaline running, um, the ability to focus becomes much easier. And at times when that does not exist, um, focusing becomes much more difficult. So with all that said, of course, as always, um, my name is Rich Sheffer and I do these live streams every Tuesday and Thursday. I'm not going to do it this Thursday, though, because I've got too many conflicts. We're working on a campaign right now that I'm behind on. And so uh, that is also an ADD uh, trait very often. Um, and so I'm going to be working on Thursday uh, on the campaign more so than doing this. Um, but <clears throat> What I always try to do is make this as much of a dialogue and less of a monologue. It's one, because it's a lot less boring if it's a dialogue versus a monologue. And two, um, it helps with the algorithm gods. And three, it allows me to talk to you specifically and to address your comments, your concerns, your questions, etc. I also have a friend in town who's helping me with the campaign. He didn't know that when he uh, said he was coming here. Um yeah ambush yeah i kind of ambushed him but like i wanted to hang out with him um it just so happened that the timing kind of sucked um because i didn't get my work done as much as i should have before he got here but i was lucky that uh he's an extremely talented marketer and copywriter um has a business that does like uh can i say like i can't give a number but mid mid eight figures um and uh primarily based on the copy chops of him and his partner. And uh, so he's actually been a guest in Steal Our Winners and one of the funniest copywriters, if not the funniest copywriter I know. Uh, I don't know if I would say best looking copywriter I know. Would you want to come around the camera just so you could say hello? Uh, his name is Julian Reyes. Um, and... Uh, Hi. You're looking straight ahead. Where do I look? No, straight ahead. Oh. Look there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The camera really does add 40 pounds. Uh, well, that's the image that's kind of uh, disturbed because this is what it really looks like. But just because that ca that that monitor is a little bit is skewed. That, is that what I look like? You look like this. Oh, God. All right, time, yeah. to, time to cut some calories. Huh? No. But you can jump in if you want. Okay. He's got ADD as well. Yeah, um, what are we talking about? Well, first, we're going to say hello to a bunch of people. And then... Uh, and put their comments up and then we'll dive in. So uh, I said, hi all. And um, then uh, Jason Bork said, hello, Rich. And let me know where you guys are watching from. Cause it's always nice to know where, how international we are. Um, we have Tina in the house. Hey, Tina, looking good as always. Uh, Anne Marie is in the house. Good to see you, Anne Marie. And uh, Hamza is in the house and you can tell like where they're watching from because it says like that like that little thing, right? So he's Hamza's on YouTube. Uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. And how about you? Uh, hi, Rich from Montreal, Canada. Good to see you, Mr. Rahari. Uh, and Mud Mudzi is on YouTube. Good to see you, Mudzi. And Dale is, uh, I'm here with my ADD hat on him. I got that. I have that hat too. Uh, that's brilliant. Well-made social proof video. Thank you, man. Um, is it too soon to post a question? No, not at all. Please post your questions, but let's try and keep them ADD related or work related so that I can make sure that 
uh, we stay on track today because, you know, with my ADD mind, if you ask me a question that's not related, I'll go down some tangent that might not make a lot of sense. Hey, Stephen, good to see you. And Hamza, I'm sold. I'm not selling anything today. Um, uh, Richard Kevin, good to see you, Richard. And Glenn in Highland Beach, good to see you. And Bill Lynch in Northern Virginia, good to see you. And Dafiri in Nigeria, good to see you. And Manuel in Vancouver, Washington, good to see you. And Kevin, hey there, Kevin, on YouTube. And uh, Leanne on Facebook, good evening. So she's got to be somewhere in Europe, I guess, since it's not evening here in the U.S. Uh, Dean Anthony is squirming. I'm not sure why you're squirming, Dean Anthony. Um, no reason to. Uh, we're all amongst friends here. Uh, ADD is a huge disabling for me. Thank you so much for doing this, Rich. Well, Hamza, I'd really love to know why it's a disabling, uh, why it's so disabling for you. How does that show up? Um, how does that like really present itself? Because that would be really useful for me because then we can talk specifically to you about whatever it is that it gets in the way of and how it gets in the way of. We can talk about ways around that. Um, most of the strategies I have were developed because I needed them to get around the challenges that the, my ADD caused for me. And in general, ADD shows up differently for different people. And so uh, one of the things that I often teach, and it's not just an ADD thing, it's just a pretty much everything in entrepreneurship, is really knowing uh, how to outthink yourself, knowing what your patterns are, and being able to put things up in advance of you going down those roads um, so that you're cutting yourself off at the pass. And so a lot of the things that I'll share are ways that I've kind of realized how I go off track and how to prevent myself from doing that. Um, but we'll get to that. Okay. Oh, what the hey, LOL, Rich. Is it okay to work with three coaches or should I stick to my one awesome one till he takes me as far as I, it feels like I'm going to go? Hope that makes sense. I have an awesome coach already, but uh, so much I want to learn, have trouble focusing. Well, what I would say, Tina, is that if you have ADD, probably better one coach at a time. Um, <clears throat> you know, in general, I mean, my I don't know if you feel differently about this, and it's always okay to feel differently about things. Um, but for me, I like to learn from, <clears throat> I like to learn, if I'm learning from a specific person that I believe is an expert or a coach, I generally try to do my best to have that be my sole source of learning during that period of time. Now, I might not commit to anything for several years, um, but for several months, for sure, um, my preference would be to absorb as much as humanly possible from a given, either in a given topic or a given person. Uh, I feel, one, it's a lot easier to stay focused that way. Uh, two, I can be a sponge for that person I can't be a sponge for three people. It's impossible, especially when there's any kind of conflict there between what one person's saying versus another. And so the best that you can, Tina, I would stick to one at a time. Let one coach take you as far as they can take you. Now, most coaches that I know are not very good at saying goodbye. Uh, they'll want to stick with you longer than you probably need them, uh, especially if you're going to jump to another one. So it'll be uh, inherent on you really to figure out when the right time is. But I would say if I'm sitting in your shoes, I do one at a time. So I do them consecutively, not concurrently. And I pick and choose based on what is most important to me at any given moment. Any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I mean, I totally, I know you said I should disagree or I could disagree, but I'm not going to disagree because, uh, you're speaking to the mic. Oh, hi. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I think that the tendency for ADD people and I'm, definitely one of them mm -hmm. uh, is, is to do different things and to have different coaches. And, you know, you talked about hyper-focusing uh, earlier. I agree. Like maybe it's good to pick whoever you think is the best coach and hyper-focus on implementing what that coach gives you. Cause it's easy to get stuck in the analysis paralysis mode too. Totally agree. And the, along those lines though, something that might be uh, interesting to talk about here for a second is that like Julian has uh, some amazing uh, VSLs, right? And they start out in ways that you wouldn't normally, they start out differently than most VSLs. We could start with that. And so I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that it's inherent in my character, and I wonder if it's inherent in your character and it's related to the VSLs, um, is that 
and I think it's an ADD characteristic, that's why I'm bringing it up, that I have a tendency to want to do things my own way, right? Like, even if I know that, like, this is the best way to go from point A to point B, but if this is the way everyone else is doing it, I want to try and figure out a different way to do it, right? Like, there's this consistent, continual, like, internal pressure um, that I create myself for myself um, that's really about me doing things differently than the way the norm is or whatnot, right? It's great for being a guru, right? Because most of what I do is different than most, right? So it makes it easy. I have a, a wide reservoir of stuff to pull from, but it's just also our inherent nature. And so I feel like as a copywriter, you've really leveraged that part by making it okay to like start out your VSLs in extremely creative ways, totally different ways, which is great for getting attention, but is also like a way of leveraging the superpower of ADD by saying like, yeah, well, I'm going to want to do it differently anyway, so I might as well do it differently in a way that's superior. Like, did you ever think that through? Was it just always natural? Like, take the uh, mic for a second sure, and sure. talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in on that. Um, you know, Rich, Rich, you, you talked about um, how a lot of ADD people have the ability to hyper-focus, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of, it's almost like counterintuitive to what people think ADD is. Like you're all over the place, but when you, but you have this ability sometimes, and it's hard to actually control where that ability manifests, yeah. unfortunately, but you're just able to zoom in on something. And that's where like the brilliant stuff kind of can happen. For me, like I, I really, really enjoy, I tend to hyper-focus on things that I'm really enjoying. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy not just like when writing a sales video or, or trying to solve a marketing challenge, I, tr I really enjoy attempting to come up with something that's out of the box. It's not formulaic or maybe it follows certain formulaic principles, but then it kind of deviates and does something different. Ironically, um, in doing that, I have the best stuff I've ever written, the best stuff I've ever produced didn't follow a formula. It broke the mold and that's where we've actually made the most money. So there is that side benefit that by honoring that kind of deviation and that doing something differently um, can, if it's executed well, make you a lot of money. But the caveat on that, and tell me if this is true or tell me if it's not, is that before you did that, you did study copywriting like a ninja and really learned all the proper things so you weren't like coming up with rules like out of the blue or violating rules out of the blue you knew what the rules were and then could do what you did to make it better yeah you, you got to know the rules before you can break them right you got to know the rules before you can break them all right cool so we'll continue on with people but anytime you want to chime in i'll just step to the left or right yeah you can always pull up a chair if you want that yeah you're good there um, so hopefully Tina, that answers your question, but throw questions my way and I'll be glad squirrel. <laughs> uh, hello, Rich. Hello, Emmy J and all the ADDs. Oh, not trying to be funny. I guess women naturally have ADD and we multitask a lot. We never complained about it though. It's a blessing. LOL. Well, it's a little bit different, uh, but women can have ADD as well. Um, you know, Kim, my girlfriend is convinced she has it. Uh, no, no, if she does, I don't know if she's ever been diagnosed. I, was diagnosed like in my thirties, but there you go. I got it. And one daughter too. Yeah. I think one of my daughters might have it as well. Uh, but both my daughters say they have it. Um, so totally on the same page there, Dean, uh, Emmerich Ola from Portugal, just found the audio dispatch files on my computer from some time ago. Thank you with appreciation. So the audio dispatches were audios that I used to do right before my weekly Q and a calls for my coaching program. And so the audio dispatches were just basically whatever was on my mind, I would share some content so that there was content in addition to me answering a lot of questions. I can help with those calories, LOL. Uh, yeah, you're a trainer, I bet. Uh, hey, hey, Fort Collins, Colorado. Hello, Bruce Bro Brodeen. Uh, and Jim Brown in San Diego and Arnold the Enjoyer Flores in Wyoming. Good to see you. And Teresa Delgado on Facebook. Facebook. Good to see you, Teresa. It's been a long time. Dave Newton in London. Good to see you, my friend. And Stephen in uh, Roby, Kenya. Just expanding my mind with these lives. Cool. And stay safe from COVID down there. Uh, and Anne-Marie in Tulum, Mexico. Good to see you. And Roberto in Mexico, I believe. Good to see you. And uh, M. Michael Rahari. Good to see you. And 
Julian Reyes, did I spell that correctly? Is that how you spell it? R E I S S. No, it's R E Y E S. R E Y E S. Yeah, I knew that. Um, Tish, hello to you and Facebook and Yusuf, hello to you on YouTube. And Lauro on has no comment and no image. That's interesting. Uh, how to choose which opportunity with ADD a framework? Okay, well, I don't know that um, you can identify a specific opportunity versus a different opportunity as it relates to ADD. But what I would say is the first thing that I think is really important for anyone to know, probably even more important for someone with ADD to know, is what is your motivation strategy? Like, when are you at your best? So for someone like myself, right? Like, let me just pull this up really quick so I can show you this um, and get rid of the comment here for a second. Uh, this was a presentation I gave to copywriters at Agora um, on how I learn. And, uh, and so what you can see here is I put some bullet points about my motivation strategy. And so, you know, as someone with ADD, and I think this is more of an ADD characteristic, um, I'm very quick to potentially kind of dismiss something or not be as motivated if it's just uh, something that I have to do. Um, but if the opportunity, if I think the opportunity is large, right? Like that is a thing that will help me be more motivated than less. What I've discovered about that more recently is uh, something that I think is more specific to me, but maybe for some of you, it's the same. Um, I have to feel like the opportunity is something that if I were to execute it flawlessly, I have the potential to have large impact. Like I change something, um, change the way marketing was done, change the way retailing was done, change the way hypnosis was done, but something that like, I, because I, existed, the world is now different. Like that's how big of an opportunity sometimes uh, those kind of opportunities get me really juiced and excited. Is there an external real deadline, right? Because real deadlines that are external and public are very good for me to get focused and like a laser beam. Uh, am I motivated? Like, is it right for me? Is this something that I feel plays to my strengths? Is it something that like I tend to be good at? as opposed to something that is requiring me to be someone different than who I really am, which is very not motivating. Are the stakes high? Because when the stakes are high, that increases the adrenaline and the pressure and the adrenaline and the pressure helps me focus. So when the stakes are high, it's more likely that I will rise to the occasion. And then last but not least, would I be letting people down? Um, you know, I care deeply about how I relate to other people. And so, um, you know, one of the things that as it relates to an external deadline is that external deadline people are depending on. And the more people that are, are depending on that external deadline, the more likely it is that I'll be disappointing more people if I don't hit it. And that's a good thing for me. And I think knowing what your motivation strategy is, and those are just like some bullet points when I started thinking about like, when am I at my best? When do I find it really easy to get work done? And if you think about that, then that should like provide some clues as to what needs to be present in order to pull from you the absolute best. Anything that you want to add, like as far as how to choose the right opportunity or your motivation strategy? Uh, well, for, first, I actually have a question for you, Rich. Okay. Everything you just read, are, are those really there to help get you into hyper-focus, to increase the probability that you're able to hyper-focus on something? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like those things will all get me into hyper focus. Right. So, you know, I've, I've shared this overall strategy uh, a bunch of times, and this relates very much to ADD. So I'm happy to share it here that, you know, a lot of the stuff that I first started teaching like 25 years ago or 20 some odd years ago when I started coaching people, um, a lot of the stuff that was not commonly known back then is now commonly known right? Like building a business around your strengths and stuff like that. So nowadays, I don't spend much time talking about those things because there's enough other people talking about those things. When I was coaching, you know, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about those things. So I spoke a lot about them. But one thing that is one of that group of stuff that I used to teach a lot that um, 
that didn't make it into like common ways of thinking where lots of people teach is that I still feel that most entrepreneurs make the mistake of building a business that is really designed for some mythical entrepreneur they hope to be one day, not who they truly are. And what I mean by that is, is that like they design, you know, as the entrepreneur, as the owner of the business, like you are the king and you can really decide how everything is done inside that business. And unfortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs kind of take that for granted, kind of forget about it or whatever. And so they design this business that they're creating around a better version of who they truly are, which is not who they truly are. And there was this great book like 10, 12, 15 years ago called Change or Die. And it was written by this physician that uh, a well-known like cardiologist or whatever that uh, discussed like what happens when people are given that choice um, that you either have to change everything that you do or you're going to die because, you know, they have had like a triple bypass or some kind of serious cardiac event. And 90 percent of the people don't change because personal change is really hard. And so that's one of the reasons why I believe it's a big mistake to build a business around something you're not, because the likelihood of you being that is 10%. It's, you know, 90% when given the choice between changing or dying, end up dying. So probably going to be somewhere in the same kind of ballpark. And so to make this more concrete, right, like I tend to be a procrastinator and a perfectionist. And, and, and I unfortunately have, I think I'm beyond this a little bit. So when I talk about this, I'd like to use past tense, but I'm sure it's a, it still flavors my work that um, I attach too much of my self-worth and self-esteem to the work that I put out, right? And so uh, not really distinguishing between the two, right? So if I do good work, then I'm good. And if I do shitty work, then I'm bad. And, and that's not necessarily healthy, nor would I recommend that to anyone. Um, but that will cause perfectionism and procrastination. And so having the person on top of this business be a perfectionist and a procrastinator. When I first designed strategic profits and we first like grew the business, I did it in a way that a perfectionist and a procrastinator could actually thrive. And so the way that happened, and that's why every program that I ever created, I first did live because me creating a program like in a hotel room or in my office here, the likelihood of it ever getting finished is not likely. Right. Whereas like if I wrote a free report and I got a lot of people to buy a program that didn't exist and then I delivered it live right now that, you know, if you think about my motivation strategy, there is a big opportunity. Like generally I would be, I would have sold millions of dollars worth of a program. Right. There are, is a real deadline because like every week I got to deliver a module. Right. I'm motivated because I sold this program and I am it's right for me. Right. The stakes are certainly high because I don't want to disappoint the 2000, 3000 or 4000 buyers of this thousand plus dollar product. Right. And I'd certainly be letting them down, my team down and everybody down. So it was really easy for me to get the modules done each week. I'd be very hyper focused on that each and every week because I designed my whole business for a perfectionist procrastinator to thrive in, right? I could do things that other people couldn't do by, you know, creating these programs on the fly for these, for my audience. And so I would say that like, when you look at the opportunity with ADD, when you know your motivation strategy, are you going to be able to thrive in whatever it's causing or calling out for you to need to do in order to make that work? Does that make sense? Totally. Anything you want to add? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, I want to add something because you talked about the the mythical uh, figure that we try and right. build our business around. And, you know, when I think about my own trajectory, like I started my first LLC in 2007 and didn't make a dime in reality until 2010. I just puttered around and said, oh, I've got a business. Mm -hmm. And then from 2010, really for eight years, you know, I, I plateaued. I plateaued at, you know, whatever, a million bucks top line, which after, you know, all your expenses, you know, it's a good living, but you're not like stacking money. You're not doing anything like super cool with it. So I was plateaued. And I think in retrospect, the reason that I was plateaued, if I had to pick one reason, it's because I didn't really understand or acknowledge my own weaknesses, my own failings. And then in 2000, if I had to like say like one thing, the biggest catalyst 
uh, that kind of led to our own growth and our own, you know, exponential progress um, in, in our verticals. It's that at one point I just realized, all right, I suck at this, this, and this. I'm really good at hyper focusing at this, but these other things I'm not so good at. Uh, was I? I found a business partner uh, who you know, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew. I, I found a, a great business partner who was also a copywriter, but he he was a much more structured thinker than I am. Like if I'm if I'm a train. Uh, and I'm a train that goes off the tracks a lot. Right. My personal belief, which ties back to the, your superpower analogy, is that when you go off the tracks, like a lot of the best ideas, those groundbreaking, pivotal ideas, they're they're in the brush. They're right. not they're not on the tracks, right? So that's valuable too. But Andrew, um, he, he's able to think in a structured, clear way, stay organized, and stay keep us on the tracks. So we've got a beautiful synergy there. So like if I had to recommend one thing besides Adderall, uh, <laughs> to, to help, um, it's, you know, un recognize your weaknesses. And then if you can very carefully and methodically find, you know, a partner or somebody that can help compensate for those weaknesses. Uh, to me, that was the highest leverage thing I've ever done. Yeah, I would say, well, so I would agree on that. Um, that's where I use Matt, right? Like, cause Matt also doesn't have ADD and he's much more structured. And, you know, for me, like when I'm in any of those modes, Right. Like I don't want to do anything else. Right. Everything like is everything else to me is like an annoyance. I, I've, right. I've seen it. <laughs> and 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 a lot of those things need to be done. And, you know, so it's really good if there's like a buffer between you and the world uh, during those times. And Matt certainly plays that role for me um, before Matt. Like I've always had a right hand person. Um, I needed one. Uh, and before I had a right hand person, like I'd have an assistant and that assistant would be very much aware of the fact that I have ADD and, you know, would help that assistant help manage me. But uh, and then even on the Adderall side, just to talk about Adderall for a second, because, um, you know, I have a prescription for Adderall. I use it sometimes. I don't use it most of the time, but I do use it sometimes. I'm using it right now because I got this big campaign I'm working on. But um, with Adderall, like Adderall will, for me, and I would imagine for you too, it helps push you into hyper-focus mode. And so what I have to be very careful of when I'm using any kind of stimulant, and it doesn't matter whether it's Adderall, modafinil, whether it's any of the racetams, whether it's bromantine or, you know, 9-ME-BC uh, or anything else, right? Um, I have to be very uh thoughtful about what i do next because like if i'm unstructured when i take it i could become very hyper focused on stuff that's completely irrelevant and like you know in research mode or something like that so those are tools for hyper focus but if used incorrectly they will take you further away from the like actual completion of what it is you might be potentially wanting to take the Adderall or any kind of stimulant for. It's, and, like, it's yeah. like a big, it's like a big laser beam, yeah. but you can lose control of it and just start shooting the wrong Yeah. Stuff. You can yeah. spend eight hours yeah. like studying something that was completely not necessary. And so it's just very, you have to be careful with that. So let's keep going and we'll see uh, where we go. So hello, Cornell in Texas. Um, at what point did you decide to take ADD part of your identity? Uh, do you think it might hurt your brand? Uh, no, not at all, because I find that most entrepreneurs struggle with ADD. In fact, I wrote um, so I wrote two reports back in 2007 called the Attention Age Doctrine one and two. And uh, that's back when Gary Vaynerchuk and I were really close. And, you know, it's actually um, one of the bummers. And, you know, Jay Abraham has ADD as well. And his ADD, I'd say, is worse than mine. But one of the bummers about ADD is that um, we constantly want to move on to the next thing. Like, you know, like I can't spend my whole life focused around one topic unless that topic has lots of things changing in it all the time. Um, and so Gary Vaynerchuk and I were on the same page as it related to attention and where the attention was going and all that back in 2007 when I wrote these reports. And then 10 years later, when I was at a traffic and conversion uh, event, Gary was the keynote and he was talking about the same shit at the keynote that we used to talk about like late night on the, you know, on the phone. And it's just very real to me that like one of the, one of the negative aspects of ADD is that you're probably going to be jumping from thing to thing to thing. And you have to figure out a way to leverage that as opposed to like, you know, because most of the money is made and stuff by, 
not jumping from thing to thing, but by exploiting as much as possible from that thing. And that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted my business. I mean, it didn't work out and I ended up buying it back. But one of the reasons why I sold my half my business to Agora in the first place was in the back of my mind, I had this dream that as I jumped from thing to thing to thing, like they would continue to monetize all the old things, you know, continuously. But uh, anyway, I wrote these two reports, Attention Age Doctrine 1 and 2. And the first one was all about how attention was going to become more scarce online and what were the implications for entrepreneurs. And I wrote in that report about how of the, you know, back then, I don't know how many gurus I had already coached, but like, I think like 70 plus gurus. And of those 70 gurus, like 90% of them had ADD. And I thought like, you know, even then it was a kind of superpower for gurus, one, because it gives them the freedom to express their own ways of doing things. But two, like the Internet is this vast place and being able to jump from thing to thing to thing at certain times can be an advantage. And so I think that for those reasons, it's not a um, it does. It's definitely doesn't hurt my brand at all. If anything, it makes people feel uh, more, uh, like me. And therefore I know what they're struggling with. And, uh, and so I don't think that that's a challenge whatsoever. And I didn't really start talking about ADD though, until I was diagnosed with it. And the method of the way I market was greatly impacted by the way that I eventually was convinced that I had ADD because what happened was, is I was going to a psychologist because I had gotten screwed over in a business deal righteously, so righteously that um, it changed my personality and I didn't like how my personality changed. Um, I had a lot of suppressed rage after that. And so I went to a psychologist like two or three times a week for six months to kind of work out that rage so I could get back to who I knew myself to be. And at the end of that, the psychologist said to me, you know, this is really not my wheelhouse, but I think you have ADD and you might want to check it out someday. And that's when I thought it was like, I said, okay, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, that's a crock because I tend to hyperfocus and I didn't know that hyperfocus was an ADD thing. And so it wasn't until years later when I was in a Borders bookstore, um, they've since gone out of business, but they used to be down here in in Florida and uh, there was one in Boca on Glades and 441. And I went into that Borders bookstore and on the corner, there was a book about ADD called Driven to Distraction um, by John Rady and Ed Hallowell. And that was probably the best selling book on ADD. And so I picked it up. I skimmed it. I thought it applied to me. So I brought it home. I read the whole thing. I was convinced they were talking to me. And then I asked my ex-wife to read it and she read it and she agreed that it was talking about me. And what's interesting is, is that if you think about ADD, all it really is, is a group of behaviors that they put a circle around these behaviors and they say, this is ADD, right? So me, I was someone who had struggled with a lot of these things like productivity, like, you know, planning and all these kinds of things uh, and had six would be successful for some short period of time and then fall off the wagon. And it was just like this continual challenge in my life. And so I was reading this book and driven distraction and it was explaining all those things. And so for the very first time I was reading something and I, that I felt it was describing my situation, which if you've ever had that experience, you tend to lean in because you're like, Holy shit, like they're talking to me. And so I'd be, I was reading it and they're ascribing all these behaviors to ADD. And so in that moment, I went from someone who had struggled with a lot of behaviors that had kind of lost hope of ever figuring those things out and fixing those things to now understanding the real reason I had, I struggled with these things and a newfound hope that I could get rid of it because like now I knew the true source. I knew the underlying cause. Like I had been trying to fix the symptoms, not the actual cause of the symptoms, ADD. And if you look at my reports, that's what I've done consistently. Like the Internet Business Manifesto, I circled a bunch of behaviors in the market and I labeled that an opportunity seeker as opposed to ADD. Right. And therefore, like my solution was fixing that deeper cause, which was like what I was hoping to find with ADD once I had read that book. And so just an interesting factoid there. Anything 
I'll add just one thought, um, which is, uh, you know, I think it's a really cool theme to, to talk about, well, how, how do you turn ADD into a superpower, right? Because we, we, we know it can be, but how do you actually do it? And uh, the techniques that we've talked about so far, uh, obviously, uh, one of them is uh, accountability, mm -hmm. right? Um, by the way, another uh, advantage of me getting a business partner, whether it's an employee or an assistant, is that that actually has accountability built into it. Uh, another could be Adderall or Modafinil. Uh, another could be accountability contracts, which I did for a long time. That That's uh, really helped me a lot. So like, I'd be curious, you know, Rich, for you in particular, right. what have you done that helped uh, sort of turn your ADD? Because I think a lot of the reason that you've been so successful is actually because of your ADD and, and so. not even in spite of it. So what, what was sort of the highest leverage thing that you've done over the years to kind of channel that and make it an advantage? Uh, well, I would say some of the things that I do, right, are definitely, um, definitely I do same stuff, right? Like definitely sometimes using stimulants has been game changing for me. And to be honest, like, and I think, I don't know if a lot of other people have this experience or not, but for me, um, most of the stuff that, like I did all these things way before I ever knew I had ADD, I was kind of like self-medicating. So back in college, like I would take um, Broncade, which had ephedrine in it. It was the only way to get ephedrine back then. Um, and, uh, and ephedrine, you know, obviously is just as powerful as like a, um, as Adderall or anything like that. And, um, I would generally have some bronchade, Diet Coke and chew tobacco and I'd be sitting and working. Right. Um, so that I, I always kind of self-medicated first, but I'd also say that like when it comes to writing, for example, I will do a lot of research on my computer, but then knowing my ADD tendencies, like when it comes time to write, I generally walk away from my computer and I write, you know, paper and pen, uh, you know, on a pad. And one of the reasons I do that is it's just too easy for me to want to keep looking stuff up. And if, and, and I run the, and there's nothing wrong with looking something up. What's wrong is, is that I, every time I look something up, I run the risk of not returning back to actually what I'm working on in that moment. And so I'm much better off getting away from the computer and actually now spending my time actually doing the work. So I'd say a big part of what was part of my struggle when I first got online was not stepping away from the computer. And one of the things that changed that was stepping away. Like I wrote the manifesto, I wrote these reports like offline, right? Like, you know, pad and paper first, then would put stuff, uh, you know, either I would type it or I would dictate it and it would transcribe or I gave it to my assistant. And so that certainly made a difference. And then also recognizing, um, and then this is, uh, recognizing that the, where like the, the right place to play for me. Like, so it wasn't only that, like getting away from the computer, right? So let's talk about those things first, right? So getting away from the computer was huge. The next thing was also using a timer, right? Like racing myself, like, so setting a, you know, a, a clock for 60 minutes and promising myself that I wasn't going to do anything other than write for those 60 minutes, or at least sit in this chair and not move from the chair for 60 minutes and not like pick up my phone, not pick up my iPad or anything, but just sit and write for 60 minutes. Um, I would say uh, the, my keeping my journal has been game changing for me. I don't know if this is an ADD characteristic or not, but like without any check in or anything, I can tend to go like two weeks on automatic pilot and then be like, what the hell did I do the last two weeks? And so for me, the journal checking back in with my journal on a daily basis kind of keeps me present where I don't go on autopilot. So I'd say the the big game changes for me were a timer, my journal, writing offline. And then I would also say using mind maps, actually, because like for me getting organized or getting my head around what I was going to write about or talk about or whatever, like I found it much easier to start with a mind map where I could just be throwing ideas at first and I could have all these different ideas. I could kind of be looking at them, whereas in an outline, it made no sense and it got a little bit like. I'd get a little anxious because now like this all makes no sense. Yeah. Like, whereas in a mind map for me, 
it would be, it, it's supposed to not make any sense in the beginning, right? And so plan on a mind map, execute offline, use a timer, right? Check in with myself, like as each time the timer would go off, like when I'm working on something extremely important and I want to make sure I stay on track, one thing I'll do is I will use my journal as almost an accountability partner. Like I'll check back in with my journal every hour, like how the last hour went, like how, you know, and so, yeah, there might be an hour when I kind of messed up, but like I'm writing of that in my journal, like, okay, it's 1 PM. The last hour I kind of wasted by going off track here. Like I'm going to make sure that I, this hour, like, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then the other thing, which is just, I think this applies to everyone. It's not just an ADD thing, but it's probably more important for ADD people is recognizing that you can, that your context, your environment, like plays a major role and you want to engineer your environment to be conducive to getting work done. And so that like, like Evaldo, for example, Evaldo, when he used to live before he moved to Puerto Rico, uh, when he used to live in Miami, like he had a two story place and he always left, he wrote in his office upstairs, but he always left his phone downstairs, right? Like, because he didn't want to be tempted while he was writing to get on his phone. And so, you know, whether it's, it's about pre-thinking what your distractions would be and eliminating them, putting yourself in a situation where you're more likely to get work done. So for me, for example, um, I'm always going to like, well, I don't know if always, I am much more inclined to getting work done when I'm around other people uh, than when I'm sitting alone, right? And that it doesn't matter. Like, ideally, I don't even know those people, right? Like, so it's like, I'll get a lot more work done in a hotel lobby than I will in my hotel room by myself right um there's added people around like i feel the need to work as opposed to like explore extract like you know different um you know different distractions etc so i'd say that those are some of the things so like a lot of times if i'm working on something important and i'm going to work offline now i don't even need my laptop i can go anywhere right with a patent paper and some you know papers that are the research i've already done and i might go to a starbucks might go to the beach right like but i'll be in a nice atmosphere that I enjoy being at, but with my timer and now I'm like working. Right. And, and that works. Any strategies that you have? Uh, oh man. Um, I have strategies, but the, I mean, how, how frank can we be here? Can be how, I mean, like, all right. So first yeah. off, I have a girlfriend now and she's awesome. And it's a serious relationship, but I used to be a dating coach and, uh, and a good one. And, um, you know, sometimes I went through a phase where I was, you know, playing the field a lot. And a lot of the times, especially after my business started to take off and I had a little bit more um, cash flow is, you know, I'd meet a girl online, but she lived far away. And then I'm like, well, come on down. I'd, you know, fly her in. And then inevitably, or at least most of the time, you know, she would stay for whatever, three days or something like that. But then like after like six hours, like I wanted to kill myself and I was super bored. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to start working. I'm going to tell her I got a lot of work to do so I don't have to like sit in here and interact the whole time. And then like the next two and a half days, like I'd get more work done than in, in my entire life. So I don't know if that's a strategy that you can implement, <laughs> but that, that's, that's what came to mind. So invite visitors that you're excited to see that you quickly get bored of. Yeah. All right. That's a strategy. Um, all right. So let's see what we got here. Um, so James said, uh, you're revealing your ADD suggested to me that I might have it without knowing it, even though I'm 88 years old today. Wow. Well, happy birthday for one. Uh, you might have it, but at 88, um, you look great. And, uh, you know, what are you trying to accomplish now that you are 88? I guess that's part of the, the to even consider like whether you need an ADD strategy. Uh, for me, I get off track going down rabbit holes and get lost for hours reading or watching. And before I know it, hours went by and I've accomplished nothing. Well, that's interesting, Kevin. So like, you know, I would say that you just got to be more, um, what's the word? Um, why am I drawing a blank on this word? More purposeful, but that's not really the word I was thinking, uh, trying to come up with um, in whatever rabbit hole you go down. Now, the other thing is like, and I'm not, I don't, I don't know that it's the best time to talk about this in depth today here, but I've definitely done it in different live streams. One of the processes that I follow like workflow wise, as it relates to research is progressive summarization that I learned from Tiago Fort. And, um, 
And that process is basically constantly rechecking back in with my notes, not constantly, but whenever I'm working on a topic to look, to keep a trail of what I've done in the past and be able to check back in on that. And I do that in Evernote. So I go down rabbit holes still to this day, but I generally don't do it when I'm supposed to be getting other work done. And I want to, though, leave a, I want that to benefit me later on. So back in the old days, right? Like, hold on, I'm just going to grab something. Um, like back in the old days, back in the old days, when I was doing research, like a lot of times that research would then find its way like onto index cards like these, right? And at some point I want to put these in Evernote because these are old, this is old research. But nowadays all my research is done in Evernote, which means that anything I come across, anything online, before I read it, like in my browser, I actually save it to Evernote. And then I read it in Evernote. And if I find that it's not worth reading, I just delete it. Um, if I read it, then as soon as, I, the first thing I do is I select all the text and I remove anything, any bolding out of the text. So it's control A, or command A and then command B to just make everything unbolded. And now as I'm reading, going down that rabbit hole, I will bold anything that I think is important. And I know that when I go across one of my notes that has all those, those bold blocks, I know that I've already gone through this once. And now the next time I look at it, all I'm doing is looking at the bold parts and then I'm highlighting what's most important to that. And there's a whole process to it. But Knowing that you're good. So for this, Richard, like what I'm saying is, is that if you know you're going to go down rabbit holes from time to time, right, which if you have ADD, odds are um, you will. Right. Then the next question is, OK, one, how do you avoid going down rabbit holes when you most can't afford it? Right. Because like you're racing a deadline or something that's really important. And so like those workflow strategies about getting offline, you know, timer, all these things can be helpful. The other thing though, is to recognize that you will go down rabbit holes from time to time. And then how do you make that most effective for yourself, right? For someone like me who teaches and consults going down, generally I'm going down rabbit holes in topics that I generally teach on or consult on. And so I want to make that time productive. And the way I make that time productive is to make sure I leave a trail behind me so that when I pick that stuff up again, I have actually benefited from the time down that rabbit hole. Does that kind of make sense? And so that's what I would suggest for you, Richard. All right, Hamza, it's disabling because when I'm doing some tasks, I get the idea that there are other tasks I should be doing. Also, I have to do multiple tasks at once in order for me to focus. Totally get that, right? So that's why, like, for me, in that motivation strategy, am I working on something big? If I'm working on something big, generally, I'm not distracted by other things because they're not as big as that thing, right? Now, the other part, though, this is something I learned from Telman Knutson, who was a client of mine a gazillion years ago, who then also coached in ADD. And one of his suggestions, which I loved, was to break up your project into many little pieces, which everyone does and you should do anyway, because you can't like attack a project, you can attack a piece of a project. But if you break up the project into numerous pieces, then you get the benefit of like being able to jump from project to project, but these are sub projects and you're moving the same project overall forward right so like you know let's say you're working on a funnel right some of that is copy some of that is text some of that is graphics some of that is whatever right and if you're a one-man operation then you might be doing it all well then you could spend you know when you're done when you're getting bored of writing you jump to the tech when you're getting bored of the tech you jump to the graphics they all feel like different projects but they're all part of one project so you're still advancing that whole thing forward, right? Or if it's completely a writing project, you know, there could be times when you need to do research, times when you're doing writing or writing the beginning part, the middle part, the end part, whatever, different sections. You can break up the work into whatever would feel like you're jumping from one thing to another thing. And that allows you to keep moving forward on the main project, but still get the feeling, the ADD feeling of jumping from thing to thing. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, how can you diagnose ADD? 
Well, it's just a collection of behaviors, really. And, um, you know, I was diagnosed by a psychiatrist. Um, I think there are online questionnaires you can probably use. I don't know how accurate or not accurate they are. Um, but that would be my best guess, Roberto. Um, question. Why is it so hard to shift into that first gear with a big project and lay aside all the battling ideas, priorities, and to-dos with the big projects? I flit, flutter, in short bursts fairly well, but with the high income big ideas, I let my ADD get the best of me and procrastinate with the first critical steps and just starting that first gear. So that's an interesting question. And I probably would imagine that lots of people would identify with that. That's called task initiation. And task initiation challenges are very common with ADD. And uh, I certainly experienced that as well. It feels like very often I'm like, a dog like who walks around their mat like a hundred times before they lie down, right? Like they're, you know, I used to, I've had Great Danes most of my life and that's how my Great Danes would generally, they wouldn't just lie down. They need to walk around their mat a few times, kind of, I don't know for what reason, and then they would lay down. And that's kind of how like I feel about work. Um, what I try and do is I try to make the starting of my that kind of work as appealing as humanly possible. So you could say that um, one of the things I'm really excited that Julian's here and, you know, not necessarily on this live stream, just that Julian's here in Delray Beach with me. And um, and one of the ways that in my mind, like I knew I'd be able to work on this project a lot easier is when Julian was here. Um, now I should have gotten more done before he got here and that's my bad. Um, I was also traveling a lot and doing a lot of other stuff and we had Thanksgiving and stuff, but you know, sometimes it's about working with a friend other times. Like I might call a friend, you know, far away. And like the first thing to do is kind of describe the idea to them, do it on a recorded line, have them ask me questions and then get that transcribed. And that becomes the beginning of the project. But like, can you figure out a way to kind of get it started that doesn't require like a Herculean effort to get it going? Right. So working with a friend is always something that I enjoy. So that's one. Right. Talk sharing the idea with someone that I care about that's going to ask me good questions. That's another way. Um, you know, if, for example, Julian wasn't here, then I might have rescheduled this live stream, like about the ADD one. And I might have used this live stream to actually just begin talking about the campaign and some of my ideas for it, share it with you guys, hopefully get you to ask me some questions, share different riffs of it. And that would be a way to kind of get started other than me sitting down and writing and working. Right. But it's like, you know, any easy way to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, the other thing, uh, Bruce, is something that I've learned about myself over the years. And I first did this as it related to exercise. Then I learned it as it related to writing from Katrina Ruth. But now I apply it everywhere. And that is, is that I cannot decide whether I feel like doing something when I'm not doing it. So I first learned this about exercise. Like most of the time, I do not feel like exercising. But once I start exercising, generally I'm happy I'm exercising and I enjoy it. So the rule I always had about exercising was that I'm going to exercise daily and that I can't decide whether I want to or not until I've started, right? So like, you know, I can get, once I'm on the elliptical machine, I can decide I don't want to exercise today, but I got to make the effort to get on the elliptical machine or jump rope or whatever. And that's always worked for me because so often the biggest resistance I experience is just getting started. Um, but one time I was in a Steal Our Winners interview, I was talking to Katrina Ruth, who's a guru in Australia, and she's extremely prolific. And I asked her about like, how does she stay so prolific? And she told me that she realized that she can't really make a decision whether she feels like writing or not, unless she's actually writing. And I was like, you know, it's so funny you say that because I do that with exercise, but I never thought of considering it as related to anything else. And but it does apply to my journal, like some of my best journal entries start with I don't really feel like writing. And then I hit like pay dirt and all of a sudden I'm writing like page after page after page. So recognizing that inertia is just part of the human condition that like, therefore, generally, whatever I'm doing in the moment is generally what I feel like doing, even if I don't. I'm not really enjoying it, um, that 
doing anything other than what I'm doing is probably going to have some resistance towards it. So you can't make the decision that you don't want to work on that project until you've actually started to work on that project. And the more that you're able to make that rule for yourself, I think for anything like desirable that you cannot make the decision to do or not do until you actually have stepped in and started doing, I think is very powerful. I know for me, it's very powerful. I don't know if you ever operate that way, yeah. but yeah. Go let, ahead. let me add to that just because, uh, so, so my dad's a psychologist, which is probably why I'm so screwed up mm -hmm. and need therapy. But, um, one of the things that I always did talking about like accountability contracts is structuring in the words at least I learned this from my father. Um, who's written several books on productivity actually. Cool. And yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll show you. It's really neat stuff. But the, the point is, is that structuring in the words at least, so saying, and this ties to exactly what you were just saying, Rich, is uh, saying, okay, I'm going to extra hit the elliptical today for at least five minutes. Okay. And then, and then you're done. You, you fulfill the, your contractual obligation. But what's cool about that is, as you said, once you start it, you're probably going to keep going, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an easier bite to swallow. And then the other thing um, that helps me a lot, particularly when it comes to writing, um, but I really think it could apply to anything, is like when I sit down in front of my laptop, um, I, it was a Bruce who, who asked yeah. the question, um, you know, that's the hardest part is just like looking at a blank page. Like, okay, I've got to write the first 500 words of this sales pitch, the lead, and oh, what the hell? I, I have a vague idea or I have a general idea of what I want to write about, but like, you know, it's, it's very intimidating. So what we just do is we just outline everything first. So I just get the like, the bullets together of what I kind of want to talk about and in what order. And that makes it a lot more palatable to get started because now I'm just kind of building out this rough outline. And I think that this idea of an outline could apply to a lot more than, than just writing. So those, those are two things that have uh, helped me a lot, at least using that as a kind of a, an accountability uh, technique and then outlining something first, uh, whether it's writing or anything else. So, so wait, before you go yeah. though, like, so, do you use like, so you gave the example of like at least as it relates to exercise, but do you do that with writing as well? Like you'll, at least you'll touch this and work on the outline or at least you'll like anything like that? Everything, everything I do it with, uh, whether it's uh, writing, exercise. It used to be when I was a dating coach that I'd walk up to at least, you know, three girls on the street and say hello that day, or I'd have, uh, you know, my clients do that back then. So it could apply to absolutely anything. It just makes it a lot more, um, palatable, as I said, uh, if it's a, it's a smaller bite, right? How do you, what's the old saying? Uh, how do you eat a whale one, one bite at a time? Well, at least and setting a low bar just gets you started. So cool. And then the other thing I would say, like if procrastination is an issue for, and it is for many with people with ADD is to also, and this is, this comes from a book called the uh, now habit by Neil Fiore. And he recommends like that you keep an unschedule. And so it's like a calendar, where you only put on the calendar fun activities and you do, and the goal is to put a fun activity for every day because a lot of people with procrastination, they avoid doing the work because they think in their mind now, like once they sit down to do this work, it's going to be all work and no play for a really long period of time. As opposed to when you have fun stuff on your calendar, one, it's just healthier and it makes you like be doing stuff. But now you have a reason to race through your work because you're going to be doing this fun thing. Right. And so it's just another cool thing. Like, and you'll have a more enjoyable life anyway. Um, will this be recorded and available later? Thank you for all you do, Rich. Uh, yes, Dean, it will be on the YouTube channel. It will be in Facebook if you want to find it easiest on the YouTube channel, but also on LinkedIn and everywhere else. Uh, hi, Julian. So bummed you are there while I'm in New York, said Kim. Uh, Thanks for being on the live stream, lucky guest, and hello to that handsome fellow with you. Oh, well, hello, Kim. Uh, nice to know that you're watching. So that's also to, for her to let me know I cannot flirt on this live stream because now she's on this live stream. Yeah, uh, that was a threat. Yeah. Doing things differently than the usual flow sounds to me an extremely healthy way to go about life. It is a healthy way, but I don't really have a choice. Like the ADD part of me just wants to do things differently. Um, but it's worked well for me. So I guess I don't really fight it either. Einstein only wanted to do things his own way, rejected all instructions, structured approaches to trust his own free thinking. Yeah. There are a lot of people who have done extremely well. I was reading an article about it, um, that a lot of people could be kind of grouped into having these ADD type behaviors over the years, whether they had ADD or not is too hard to tell because none of them are alive. 
Uh, my son has ADD and has things that he hyper focuses on. So always trying to direct that focus to something productive. Yeah. I mean, kids generally like, especially young boys will do it with video games all the time. Right. And so that same enthusiasm and energy, if it can point it towards more productive things is very valuable. So totally get it, Martin. Uh, you're talking to me on my own path, hyper focus versus flow. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rich. You're doing an amazing job with these live streams. I'm thankful to you. I mostly catch them later on YouTube at higher speed. I totally get that. I listen and watch everything in high speed. I uh, just wanted to say hi today and see you in all your glory live. Well, thank you, Pratap. Where, are, where do you watch from? Uh, curious. I uh, hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, I do, too. And thank you for saying that, Martin. Um, hey, Hugo. Hugo in Miami. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, perhaps we all have ADD in different measures. I've, I've always seen ADD as attention deficit squirrel. Yeah, well, there's something called continuous partial attention, um, which is like how a lot of people try nowadays to kind of mitigate this continual barrage of information. And continuous partial attention will, for many people, give them the, you know, the, will give them the, signs of as if they had ADD, right? Because they're continuously paying attention to way too many things. Uh, so we have uh, Quinn in Calgary, Alberta. Good to see you, Quinn. And Mark in Zurich, Switzerland. Good to see you. And Martin is in Hawaii, Honolulu. Uh, is this for ADHD too? Yeah, ADD, ADHD, it's all the same. Uh, it just plays out differently. Um, how do you use your ADD to support you being successful? Well, like I've, I think I've been, you know, obviously the question came in about a half hour ago or 40 minutes ago. So I think that's what we've been talking about. And uh, yeah, there's, you know, generally like some of my best content has always been developed either in my journal where I write like, or in conversations with people. And one of the things that I'm very, that I find very easy and I'm good at is, Q and A calls, right? Cause it's very, it keeps me in the moment and it's very like conducive to my ADD brain. And so one of the things I've always had, like in all my programs is Q and A calls. Like when I've done long live streams, like a 26 hour live stream, I did it like it was all Q and A. So these are ways that for other people would be exhausting, but for me is invigorating primarily because of my ADD. The other thing is, is that, you know, I've been fortunate to pick uh, online marketing and being a strategist in online marketing allows me to kind of touch upon all the different ways that marketing is done online, which allows me to jump around a lot. And if you didn't have ADD, you might find that like really frustrating, confusing, overwhelming and taxing. But whereas I find that fulfilling and peaceful, right? So I would say that it's about picking the right spot for you. It's about understanding your motivation strategies and making sure that those are in alignment with what success will look like for you in that industry. And for me, like, you know, I started as an, I, you know, I studied accounting in college and, uh, and an accountant by training and accounting was great because it taught me the language of business, but like, I wouldn't thrive as an accountant unless I was a very high level accountant that was trying to figure out like strategies around certain things, but like the day-to-day -day job of an accountant would be very boring for me and would not be ideal for me uh, as someone who has ADD. Whereas like if I would have studied medicine, right. And I became a doctor, like definitely you don't make as much money. So maybe I would do something different, but being an emergency room doctor would be, like a job that I would probably find very fascinating and interesting, like constantly working with different people, never knowing what to expect in any given day. High yeah. High stakes, like, you know, constant high pace, right? Like these are all things that make me excited and happy, right? Like as opposed to frustrated and stressed. So Tina, this is helpful. Thank you. I just suspect I'm ADD because I relate so much. I hesitate to go to a doctor because I'm not a fan of medication. Do you think I'm correct that with a stellar nutrition exercise and mindset discipline, I can embrace the best parts of ADD and still be massively successful? Or is there something else I should be doing if I suspect I'm ADD? I'm concerned it will hurt my business success and ability to help others if I miss a treatment strategy I should know. 
I look, there's because ADD is really just a label of a bunch of behaviors um, and there is no treatment, quote unquote, to get rid of ADD. Um, the only thing that you're missing out on, Tina, would be access to either uh, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, because a lot of for a lot of people with ADD, um, because they've struggled over the years, they tend they can be more inclined to have uh, depression or anxiety. And then the other thing is stimulants like that. A lot of people with ADD uh, benefit from because it helps focus. But if you don't feel like either of those are things that you need or you struggle with, then I think you won't miss much. That doesn't prevent you from picking up some good books on ADD, whether it's uh, Driven to Distraction or The Disorganized Mind, who was written by... A co so John Rady eventually became my doctor for a period of time, uh, my psychiatrist. Uh, I don't see a psychiatrist anymore, but John Rady was my psychiatrist. And then his ex-wife, Nancy Rady, who was a ADD coach, and I think she still is, was my first coach. And uh, I wrote the manifesto and really got my shit together when I was working with her. And uh, she wrote a book called The Disorganized Mind, which I highly recommend. And then there are a lot of good books out there, like just like Living with ADD and stuff like that, that you can take the tactics from there. And I don't think you're missing out on anything. Do you agree, disagree? Yeah, uh, well, I completely agree. And... I actually just thought of a question. Hi. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, I actually just thought of a question that I want to ask to you, Rich, and, and also to everybody that's uh, – oh, no, I should look up there now. I can see my, my eyes. Um, uh, ask you guys as well, so feel free to, to comment. Uh, but my question is, and I'm actually genuinely curious, uh, is it better to think of your ADD or apparent ADD as – as an advantage or as, or as a disadvantage, right? Cause some, I get the sense that probably at least some of the people that are listening here consider their ADD to be disabling or to be a, a liability in some ways. Is it better to look at it one way or the other? Well, I would imagine that it's always better to look at it as an advantage. Now I just naturally look at it as an advantage. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't certain disadvantages that come with it, right? Like, you know, I've had my two primary mentors in my life are Jay Abraham and Mark Ford. I don't think Mark Ford has ADD. And I think part of the reason he's had uber success, right, like is because of that. Not like not most people don't have ADD and they don't succeed. So I'm not saying that the lack of ADD uh, has made him more successful, but has helped him build billion dollar businesses, right? Jay Abraham has not built billion dollar businesses. I haven't built billion dollar businesses. I've been instrumental in helping billion dollar businesses grow just like Jay has. Um, but primarily because I need to jump, like I'm going to get bored after a period of time, but I do think it's a superpower. Like, and I think it's a superpower primarily because of hyper-focusing. Whereas other people like think about this mythical state of flow for me, like that's a, that's a very common experience for me. And it's a common experience for me because there's very little difference between hyper focusing and flow. Um, it can be very different if it's not managed correctly, but when managed correctly, it is. And the other thing, and this is more maybe in a cop, like for copywriters and marketers, it's definitely a superpower. And this is why Jay is as good as Jay is. And this is, I think, why I'm as good as I am, is that I can connect two things that are totally unrelated um, because I see connections that don't exist in the world, right? Like it's part of my, it's why I can go on tangents all the time. But it's also like, if you tell me that I need to connect this with that, right? Like, give me a great idea and I have this thing to sell. How am I going to connect these two? I can always find a connection because my brain is wired to see connections much more so than other people, which is why one of the ADD things, like everything's connected, right? So in that sense, also, it's a superpower because in marketing so often, like when you're trying to spin something, you have this and you're trying to figure out like, well, what's the most like, what would be the most effective way to reframe this or reposition this or recategorize this um, so that people would see it differently and then therefore, you know, 
uh, feel differently about it. Spin in politics is like that. And uh, my brain is naturally wired for that. And if you have ADD, your brain is naturally wired for that as well. So I think it's a superpower as it relates to that. But like any other superpower, it has its pros and cons. Like there's always a downside to everything. And the downside is, is yeah, that you're not going, most likely you're not going to be methodical over many, many years just moving forward in one thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll just add that. I, I agree. I I think of my ADD as a, definitely as a superpower. Um, did you guys ever see, I, you guys can't like talk back, but no, you, can so, you can comment. I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Sure. It's an amazing film. And there's a scene where uh, Butch and, and the Sundance, they're in Bolivia and they're trying to just get a job. They're trying to go straight and be like bodyguards for this, you know, some banker or something. And, and uh, at one point, the, the banker or whatever he was, uh, he asks them, he wants to see if they can shoot. So he asks Sundance to shoot that rock that's, you know, off in the distance. So Sundance pulls out his revolver and shoots and, and misses the rock completely. And the, the banker's like, oh, you guys aren't hired. You can't even shoot. And then Sundance says, he says, can I move? Can I move? And the guy's like, huh? And then he puts his gun back in his holster and, you know, does his little kind of gunslinger stance and then there's a there's a, there's a nice revolver right over there actually yeah. um and then he just lightning fast snaps out the gun and fires three times in a row and hits the rock three times in a row because he was he was kind of just going with his impulses moving fast off the cuff and like that's how i, I think of myself <laughs> i know that sounds strange but like i kind of think of myself like sundance you know like I got to do it my own way. And I'll, I'll see, as you said, Rich, sometimes connections that, that other people don't see. And I'm, it, it is a superpower for me. However, I'll just add that I don't think that I really began to embrace it uh, or, or view it or perceive it as a superpower until I structured some kind of a team around me or created some kind of a structure around me that really began to compensate for the, the kryptonite, right? If it's, if, if ADD is a superpower, then it has its kryptonite to where I was, I brought in Andrew or other people that could kind of take things that I hated to do off of my, my plate and allowed me to hyper-focus on the things that I love. So, but what about like when you first started, because you wouldn't have had that luxury. So how did you get there? What, like anything? slowly and painfully. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I try and shortcut those times as much as possible. Um, I love the creativity that ADD gives me and it has been profitable as well. As I get older, I'm an old fart. I'm finding it harder to focus on one task without getting distracted. Yeah. Well, you know, it's also, um, I read this great book, like oh, God knows how long ago it was called the shallows. Definitely like at least eight years ago, might've been longer um maybe 10 or 11 years ago and it was written by like uh i forget who wrote it but an author i really like and um it was talking about how the ability to concentrate for periods of time like quickly decrease if you don't use it like if you're not a reader for example and you spend a lot of time reading online jumping from like link to link to link your ability to concentrate on one thing uh can quickly atrophy and so if you find yourself if that's atrophying in you, then it's a sign maybe that you need to spend a little bit more time offline where you do focus on one thing at a time, like reading or something that requires that focus. Uh, thank you, Rich and Julian. That's great feedback. Know thyself, said Dean Anthony. Uh, Lacia, I missed half of this already because phone email messages blowing up with my end of month deadlines and a big deal trying to close. Hard day to prioritize listening to something like this lol and don't most business people have end of month deadlines or is add that they are not done earlier or is it or it's add that they are not done earlier um i think your phone is blasting off no it's okay um the well you can always listen to this anytime lacia because it will be archived but the um yeah i'm i'm racing on deadlines right now um and as soon as i'm done uh uh, Julian and I will be hopping back into what he's helping me with. Uh, Eye-opening stuff for me. Cool, Stephen. Uh, what is the selling point for non-HDHD partner to work with us when our bouncing around is crazy making for the partners we need most? Well, they, you know, you have to bring something to the table, but um, the selling point is, is that your ability to 
jump from thing to thing to go into hyper focus. These are all strengths. And when properly applied, you can do things that other people can't do. So, you know, it's about divvying up the work in a way that you get to do what you do best and they do what they do best. Um, and when it works, it works really well. Oh my God. Yes. Hyper-focusing is on, on something interesting other than truly the top priorities. Yeah. Well, the trick is, is to figure out how to hyper-focus on those top priorities or figure out how you can do either how you can make that change, or maybe you need to change what you work on because take on different types of projects. Question. Glad Julian brought up Adderall. I've tried it four times, half the time. Whoa, let's go. The other half, uh, nothing. But how to get it and manage it responsibly. Strictly doctor, best to apply and use it. Uh, lastly, other over-the-counter alternatives that are similar Adderall and where to purchase. Okay. So um, what I would say is, is that yeah, if you're going to use Adderall responsibly, you're better off doing it under a physician's guidance. Um, you know, it's a strong drug and uh, people can become addicted to it. So I would certainly recommend that it's something that is done with a doctor's supervision. But most doctors will prescribe it if you have ADD, right? I mean, it's it's prescribed for that. And I have a prescription for it. And, um, you know, so on that level, that's the first part. Um, there are a lot of other things that you can take. There are some other like prescription type drugs like modafinil, which is also a drug that will help you focus and knocks out tiredness, but doesn't have like the euphoric effects of Adderall. And then there are a lot of other, uh, stimulants that you could take that will kind of, and all these stimulants, they really are designed to kind of kick you into that hyper-focus mode. So that's why you just got to be careful, like using them at a time when you're going to be productive and not go down like a rabbit hole for a bunch of hours. But I find that um, the racetams are really, really good. Um, and those are not they're over the counter, you, you, but you're not going to buy them at a Walmart or Walgreens or a CVS because they're really this gray area. Um, they're not illegal, but they're not legal. Um, they're legal to buy They're You can't really put them in supplements. If the, you could put them in supplements, I'd probably have a supplement line of nootropics already. Um, so some of the, my favorite racetams, um, are phenylparacetam, which is about a hundred to a thousand times stronger than aniracetam. Uh, I take aniracetam as well. So I take aniracetam daily, but I take it for its, um, antidepressant qualities and uh and it's not strong enough to give me any kind of major stimulant kind of thing i take it in the morning um but so aniracetam is also one that i take oxiracetam which i actually have a bottle of so hold on a second um can, can i give one tip yeah. while you're in that? all right let me give one tip to the guy who's asking about adderall so i don't actually take adderall uh anymore i i take modafinil and a lot of caffeine um, and I have other techniques, but with Adderall, which really, you know, is very powerful. I'll give you one really good tip, which is not all doctors, not all psychiatrists who are typically the ones who prescribe Adderall uh, uh, prescribe it, right? Some psychiatrists, you know, are against it because of the addictive qualities, but if you've done your research and you think it'll help you, my advice is if you have insurance, call your network, and, and actually call the doctor's offices first and just say, hey, listen, just out of curiosity, does Dr. So-and-so uh, prescribe Adderall if needed? Because some half of them, in my experience, will tell you no. So just get that out of the way first and then go go in and see a doctor that, that says that they do prescribe it. So. Got it. And um, so, okay, so the, um, oh, I'll tell you. Okay, so this is oxiracetam. Ox oxiracetam, like, that, you know, they all uh, impact people differently. Um, what I find with oxiracetam, which I like when I take it, um, is that it helps me. It's a little bit of a stimulant, but it, this, for some reason with me, uh, helps with staying, like sticking to a schedule. Like this keeps me a little bit more disciplined than other things. And then when combined with uh, salbutamine, right? So oxiracetam and sublutamine is another stack that I will often take if I'm working on something. Sublutamine helps with verbal fluency. So it's actually good for writing as well. Um, so this is a good stack. Um, 
I, I started taking something that I've actually enjoyed. Let me see if I can just pull it up really quick. Um, so, it, geez, I think it would be in my health thing here. So hold on. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm pulling it up as we speak. Uh, Hooperzine A uh, is a an interesting uh, nootropic to play around with. I'll tell you where you can get these in a second. Um, okay. So I don't know all the ins and outs of this. So uh, do your own research. But um, so there's something called uridine monophosphate. And uh, I've taken that in the past. There's something more powerful than that that's a derivative. It's triacetyl, triacetyl uridine. And uh, that I've been playing around with recently, and I dig it. And it uh, is kind of an up and uh, stimulant and also a focusing tool. Some of the other things I take as it relates, and I'll tell you where, well, so any of the racetams, the triacetyluridine or uridine monophosphate or sublutamine or any of the racetams, I get them at Nootropics Depot. Uh, so nootropicsdepot.com, that's where I order them from. And, uh, you know, but then you could also try any kind of fat burner workout thing because that will have a similar impact to Adderall. So um, I've played around with those as well. But some other uh, nootropics that I like to take that are related are, um, let me just see as I pull them up. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, L-tyrosine, uh, it's good for your dopamine uh, side. Dopamucana, which is also another dopamine precursor. Um, and uh, those two also kind of help with drive and uh, the desire to get shit done. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Um, let's see. I learned the hard way. I had to own my shit own what my weaknesses are and my strengths are. Nobody told me this when I started. I was naive and learned from school of entrepreneurial hard knocks. Yeah, a lot of people have, uh, but glad that you learned it, Emmy. Uh, greetings, Rich from Pompano Beach. Good to see you, Daryl. Um, at Emmy J, me too. Rich discoveries. I stopped taking Adderall years ago when Obamacare made my insurance too expensive to afford at my job. Totally get it. Bummer for you. I learned how to deal with it over the years. It sucks, but I'm getting by. Um, then you might want to look into the racetams because they're a lot less expensive and have like, especially something like phenylparacetam is very strong and, uh, you can get that a lot cheaper. So check out Nootropics Depot. Uh, what journal do you use? I just use my own journal. Um, I've been using two different ones over the last 25 years and, uh, Claire font or something, it's some, uh, French company that is the one I use, but I don't think it's anything special. Mind map, pen and paper, or which app? I like mind maps on pen and paper when I'm doing it in my journal, but I like MindJet because I just, uh, they were the first and I've been mind mapping for like 30 years. So uh, I never spent the time. I have a bunch of other ones like MindNode, which I use somewhat, but I don't know any of them as well as I know MindJet. Um, MEJ, I'd love to connect to see what you're doing in uh, professional singularity. Okay. Uh, it sounds like you created some non-negotiables for yourself as well as creating your environment to create a result. You're extremely proactive versus reactive. Um, only because I've been forced to only because like left to my own devices, like I would get nothing done and just be a total slob and fat and like just a loser in every which way on, um, you know, doing no work, watching YouTube all day long, smoking pot and sitting outside and doing nothing. So I've had to create these channels uh, to keep me on point and to be productive. Uh, and I think that if I didn't have those and I wasn't in an industry that I was really like excited to be in, uh, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Any thoughts about you like with that? Uh, just that, um, you know, I, it's been a recurring theme in, in this conversation, but like, for me, it comes back to like doing something that you love. I, I know it's not necessarily easy for anyone to do that. You got to pay the bills, you have responsibilities, but like everything I do, I try my best 
to make sure that I really enjoy doing it because I find the more I enjoy it, the less that my ADD is a liability and, and the more of an asset yeah. it becomes. Yeah, because if you understand that when you're interested or passionate about something, you will tend to go into hyperfocus because of ADD, then for someone with ADD, it is much more important to be doing like if to be doing things that you're actually passionate about, because like, you know, passion is one of the biggest like productivity hacks for an ADD person that ever existed. Right. It might not matter as much for the average individual, but if you have ADD, then being passionate about something is going to make you more productive than anything else that you can do, period. Right. And so that might be one of the reasons why so many entrepreneurs have ADD because they kind of were forced to become entrepreneurs because they wanted to follow something that they were passionate about as opposed to what the world told them they should be doing. Yeah. You know, can I add one thing? You can that, add whatever you want, which, which is like, we haven't really touched on it yet, but like there's a whole other component to ADD, which is uh, discipline or, or in my case, uh, a, a lack of discipline where like I've never been a naturally disciplined person. So, so maybe I've learned certain techniques that can uh, overcome HD, a, a, a ADD or, or certain techniques that can help me, you know, accomplish other goals. But if I don't have the discipline to implement those techniques, well, now I'm stuck right now. My ADD is just at full force. But if you, the beautiful thing about doing something or finding something that you love to do is discipline is no longer yes. a relevant factor. It's completely yeah. irrelevant. And yeah. yeah. And I, and I struggle with that too, personally, like, you know, like I thrive under a routine, but sticking to any routine is incredibly <laughs> difficult for me. So I get into a routine, I'm thriving. And then something about me either wants to disrupt that routine or I go somewhere and now my routine is thrown off and it's always like, how quickly can I get back into a routine? And sometimes it takes a week, two weeks, like me getting back from a trip until I'm finally back in the groove again. And that kind of sucks. But I totally can appreciate that. The, the very experiences you are describing are those I keep on noticing. I am not sure what I want to get stuck with ADD or not, but definitely what makes sense to me to focus on knowing what presses my buttons and makes things happen. Pomodoro. Yeah, that works well. Mind map, get away from the computer, creating time planners, even if it's not a journal are essential. Same for timing. Once I realize what activities are better for me to thrive in certain activities. Totally agree with everything that you said, Leanne. Um, you know, and ADD is just a label, so I wouldn't really worry that much about it. Um, all right. At 88, I outlived my retirement fund. So back to selling real estate as a broker, hard to get back to the optimum production of years of your. I could totally appreciate that. Um, so an 88 year old real estate broker, that's crazy. Oh, can, can, can I say one thing? Yeah. First, first of all, I, great I, name. Yeah. James great. Brown. James Brown. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Um, you know, I just, you commented earlier a few times and like, look, I, my grand, my grandmother's 88 and she's got dementia. You know what I mean? Like right. the fact that you're sitting here interacting and asking, you know, well, how do I like boost my productivity at 88? That in itself is like a massive life victory. So Congrats, man. Yeah. And I would imagine that like, you know, if you specialize in like helping seniors like relocate, like there's there's a niche in in real estate that you'd probably like have an advantage on because of your age. And it's about like figuring that out because like, you know, someone who is older, retired, looking to like maybe figure out where they want to retire to or like the, their downs they're downscaling because they're retired, you know, they're getting older, like they would be much more comfortable talking to someone like you than a 25 year old or 30 year old real estate broker. So um, I definitely think that there's a place for you. You're welcome, Richard. Uh, Dale, breaking up a project into parts is a powerful tool. I joined a meetup called Brainiacs where we study the brain. I was shocked to learn that the human brain is incapable of multitasking. Yeah, that's true. You know, another thing that I haven't mentioned here, I've never done it, but I've had friends that have, and I would certainly do it. It just never um, came about. Uh, but like there are these services, some of them are free where like they're accountability buddies. Like it's just like you, you want to work for an hour and someone else wants to work for an hour and they hook you up like on Zoom. It's like a Zoom kind of thing. And you both just share with each other what you're going to be working on. And then you just see each other working like in front of each other, like, 
the whole time. Like, and it's, so it's like, even when you're alone, you can be working with other people like around, you know, have you ever heard of that? Uh, I, I, I've heard of accountability buddies, but that was, it was a South Park episode. I, I think <laughs> they, they were trying not to, we're trying to stop being gay or something like that. I'm going to just like, see, as I'm talking here, if I can find like, uh, uh, work with others in front of your computer see if something comes up uh let's see now these are more general all right my friend told me about like this one service that was like that he swears by but can't see it right now all right let's keep going uh, I love how Rich's vocal cords sound. The voice is very deep, masculine, gentle, kind. Well, very nice. Thank you, Alexandru. Uh, thank you for commenting on my voice. Uh, awesome analogy and great Danes. Love them. Yeah, me too. Uh, my ADD challenge is overwhelmed. So I do research on non-essential tasks like fix the window balances to get the dopamine hit that Simon Sinek talks about to avoid what I'm really supposed to be doing. Yeah, so the... That's a challenge, right? Like the only thing is, is that you've got to dive into what's most important. You got to figure the easiest entrance ramp to it so that you avoid that whole task initiation challenge. Um, Dean Anthony says, accountability is key for me. So appreciate all your sharing. Would you do a part two? This is very helpful. Do you recommend a particular type of planner journal for ADD entrepreneurs? Here's the problem, Angela. Well, I definitely will do a part two on this. Um, but here's the challenge with, uh, at least I've found with planners and well, journal, like I just keep a standard journal, right? It's just, you know, empty pages, right? With planners, I found that no matter what planner I use, I'm really excited about it for like a month or two. And then it kind of like dissipates. And so what I do now is just make it okay that like, each one is going to have a life expectancy of a month or two. So like, so I'm only going to use any kind of planning system that doesn't require a shit ton of pre-work to get it up and running because I know that I'm going to abandon it. And whereas like a long, long time ago when I used to have my Franklin plan planner, my Covey planner and all that, like after I was done with it, I would kind of throw it away. And instead I would just keep it because I know in like six months from now, I could recycle back to that planner and be excited about it again. So I jumped from planner to planner to planner. And that is something that you can always do even uh, with like online tools, right? You could use like uh, Omni task for a couple months and then it, that you start not using it, jump to like Todoist or remember the milk or, you know, any, you have any particular favorites? Uh, I just, I, I, sorry, I, I just started using Remember the Milk, um, but I can't remember what it does. It's just a task. No, no, I, I guess. Bad joke. <laughs> but, um, but one thing that you just said kind of resonated with me, Rich, which was you said, make it okay. You know, and, and that's not to deviate, but that's like a another kind of, uh, speaking of components, another component to all this, which is like, I found for the longest time that I, I tortured myself over, you know, some of these imperfections that would would come from being ADD, you know, like, Oh, well, you know, woe is me. I can't focus. I can't do this. But like at a certain point I've kind of got, I've gotten a lot better at it. Just like not torturing myself, feeling okay. As you said, like being okay with it, just knowing like there's cycles to productivity and I have moments where I'm really strong and moments where I'm not. Um, so I, you know, I would, I would just encourage everybody here to like, don't torture yourself. Like be at peace with, of course, try to improve and make tweaks and amplify the superpower piece to it. But, you know, don't kill yourself either, man. Life's short, right? Yeah, well, yes. And I learned a long time ago that, like, no amount of self-help leads to self-acceptance. That, like, no matter how much you improve yourself, like, you're not going to accept yourself one day if that's the track that you think you will eventually find some fulfillment. And so, like, I've always thought about, like, you know, and it's an ADD thing, too. Like, I'm, I'm very clear about my uniqueness. And that uniqueness, like at least the way I like to think about it is, is that it's up to me to figure out what works best for me. So I don't claim that I have any like brand answers to anything like, you know, like as it relates to what I eat, what I, how I work out, the supplements I take, but I know what works for me. And so like, 
my girlfriend, Kim, right? Like she can't do more of a ketogenic diet, right? But I know for me, like ketogenic diet works. And I knew it worked like when I first went on it, like 30 years ago when I went on the Atkins diet. And it was like the first time I wasn't hungry. And like, I didn't become a zealot that like everyone needs to eat this way. I just am like, this was what works for me. And, you know, what works for someone else, they got to figure out what works for them. But recognizing that, you know, I, I am a unique person just as everyone else is a unique person. And comparing myself to anyone on how they do anything is just not that um, beneficial. And so who I compare myself to is myself like who I was yesterday versus today, who I was last year versus today, who I want to be and, you know, what progress I'm making. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that most, you know, most people walk around and I'm not claiming that I don't have any self-esteem challenges. You know, part of my challenges is equating like the quality of my work with my worth. But, um, but certainly I, for whatever reason, have developed the ability to, be very comfortable in my own skin as far as being willing to figure out what works for me and then doing that regardless of what like is the norm or what anyone else expects because like, yeah, I don't know. I've just always felt pretty liberal in that sense. And maybe it's, you know, but maybe it's also just been confirmation over and over again. Like I've had so many things where in hindsight, like the ephedrine or this, I was self-medicating. So it was like my body knows what's right for me. Like more often than not, when I feel right, it is right, you know, and I don't really care like what other people think. Like I remember that like when I figured out like in my early 20s, right, that the ketogenic diet worked for me, that eating protein was really important and fat like in the morning and stuff like that. So when I went to a Tony Robbins event in my early 20s and Tony was talking about natural hygiene by Herbert Shelton, he wrote a book like in the 1900s and it was all about like only eating fruit in the morning. And, you know, Tony would swear by this and would like get into arguments with people like if you raised your hand and told them you disagreed, right? And you try and back it up with all this science. Of course, now he doesn't believe that. Um, and that's part of the problem of being dis like prescriptive for large groups of people, which I wouldn't do. Um, I didn't care what he thought because I knew what worked for me, right? Like, and I wasn't about to abandon what always, what worked for me. And I wouldn't care if a doctor told me because I could find other, like I, so that's something that bothers Kim. Like, you know, because I, just because someone's a doctor, I don't naturally assume that they have all the answers and I have none. Like, you know, like if they're a doctor that happens to be well-researched on the topic that we're talking about, then of course they're going to know more because their background's more. But like, just because a doctor said something, like who cares? Like lots of people say lots of things. And so I've just always been a more independent thinker, but I think that's also an ADD trait. Like, you know, so I don't know. Um, all right. Whoops. Uh, so appreciate all your, okay. Yeah. That I got, uh, thank you both so much for all the valuable and helpful info. So great. Yes, I think ADD is definitely superpower too. All superheroes have weaknesses that they had to manage. Just makes that superpower that much better. Love this. Totally resonates with me. Thank you both. Nice. Well, you're welcome, Tina. Uh, ADD can easily destroy relationships unless you get diagnosed and treated. Adderall works well for me. If Adderall makes you calm and focused and you don't get a rush, that's a confirmation that you have ADD. I've heard that. Is that yeah, yeah, that is true. Totally agree. Um, hey, Rich, getting in late, but thankful I'm able to catch this part. What are some good New York New Year's Eve ideas? Oh, I didn't ask people to share. Thank you for sharing, uh, Trader Rob. What are, I've never had a good New Year's Eve kind of like thing. Like, um, you know, it's never been like a big deal to me that like it's a change in the year. Um, what about you? You seem like more of the party animal. So I bet you, I know you've, I'm sure you've had good New Year's Eve's. I've had good New Year's Eve's as well. But like, do you have any go-to strategies for most New Year's Eve's or no? Well, uh, since we're, since we're speaking about um, uh, psychological conditions here, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have another one I'll tell you about, <laughs> which is I definitely, as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm 42 now, you're probably thinking, oh, he looks much younger. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh 
I'm, I'm 42 now and I've definitely become like a bit of an agoraphobe, like in the last, you know, uh, five years. Like I, I really just like staying at home, relaxing. It's a big deal for me to yeah. come here and hang out Where with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like staying home. But, um, for me, like I, I would just like to do something at home, like have some close friends over some family, you know, have some champagne, keep it chill. Maybe watch it's a wonderful life. <laughs> yeah. I would tend to say, my preference is certainly to do something like that as opposed to being out in a club, having to yell over music and stuff like that. Um, so totally agree. Uh, are there supplements that help with ADD? There are a ton of different supplements that help with ADD. Um, that could be a whole live stream in and of itself. Um, but this, um, but aniracetam with sublutamine works really well. I would take a look at that, that you can get at Nootropics Depot. And as I was saying, I'm playing around with this supplement right now called trias, triacetyluridine. And uh, it has, I'm reading something here that, actually I could just share it. So let's see if I can uh, do this. I will share this page real quick. Hold on. Um, this is, and you can see like what I was talking about. I think I've already highlighted certain elements of it. We'll see. Stop screen. All right. And now share and uh, share screen and go to this window and go there. All right. And get rid of Hamza's comment for a second. Um, so this is something I just started taking like recently like in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so triacetyl uridine is a convenient way of supplementing uridine with clinical evidence for its, what's the best way to put it? Ameliora, amel Ameliorative. Yeah. That affects on depression, bipolar disorder, subjective mood and well-being, neuroinflammation and neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, blah, 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 right? It's a convenient bioavailable vehicle for supplementing uridine, which I have regular uridine in a different thing. Um, it's more of a, more bioavailable than uridine monophosphate, which is what I have. Um, okay, it converts to, it delivers four to six times more uridine in systematic in your body, alleviates symptoms of depression and bipolar, promotes a greater sense of subjective mood and well being, helps attenuate neurodegeneration in case of Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and Parkinson's disease. Uh, this doesn't take into account the benefits specifically seen, uh, which include synaptogenesis. So I guess that's included like generating new synapses, cognitive support. Uh, don't know what catecholamine synthesis is, augmenting photo phospholipid metabolism, greater neuroplasticity, dopamine upregulation, which is drive, and that's what Adderall is doing for you. Uh, improved mental fluidity and improved memory among others. Um, so this is just an article that I was reading about it. And you can see that like, what I've highlighted and, uh, or what I've bolded, et cetera. So, uh, just that's something to take a look at and, uh, yeah, we'll do one eventually. I have to go back to the nootropics one cause I didn't really do a great job on it. So I look forward to doing that, uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, what with all the pills do you take? Do you have room for any food? Yeah. Um, yeah. Kim was always making a joke about that. I probably take about like 150 different things like a day, a day. A day. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I'm always experimenting on myself, all different types of stuff. So it's another just thing I like to do to kind of see where I'm at. Uh, what do you think about the hunters farmers idea? I, I kind of agree with that. Have you ever heard of that? That like ADD is more like driven from like the hunter, like hunters, because we like different novel activities. Farmers are more like the non ADD type, like, you know, like, and, and if you kind of think about that, it makes a lot of sense. There are a bunch of books I've read about it. Yeah, I kind of agree with the concept. I never took it any further than I, that. I, I like the concept for one reason, which is it it adds to the the positive perspective about being ADD. It, it, it's it's a very positive outlook about it. Well, that plus it also like it resonates with my life experience that I'm most happy when I'm in pursuit. And so the whole purpose of the goal for me is only to put me in pursuit. And as long as it does, then I'm happy and it's a good goal. If the goal does not get me pursuing something excitingly, then it's not the right goal for me because like the accomplishment of the goal is never as all it's cracked up to be. So for me, being in pursuit is when I'm most happy. And that doesn't matter what I'm pursuing. 
It could be a, like back in college, it was a girl or grade. It could be like an outcome now, but pursuing something like actively stalking it, um, you know, when that's healthy to do um, is like how I like to think about when I'm at my best and when I feel most alive. And so hunting to me is very like real with that. Well, I, let me add yeah, one sure. thing to that just like as a metaphor uh, is that, you know, a farmer which to me sounds really boring, by the way. But uh, a farmer, you know, you've always got some milk, you've always got some eggs, you've always got some wheat or whatever you're farming. Um, but you've always kind of got food. But where like a hunter, a hunter has like that eat thrill. What you kill. You eat what you kill. So sometimes you get the wild boar, you know, or sometimes you get the woolly mammoth, right? And you eat like a king with this incredibly like exotic, amazing meal. And then there's probably times when you're hungry because you haven't caught any prey. So for me, the latter is definitely the more exciting uh, a way of life. I would agree with that. Try and look at that. Okay. Um, day one is pretty cool. I don't know what day one is. Uh, it's like we used to be hunters that we inherited ADD because it was part of our survival alert and ready to fight and flight versus the farmer who aren't living in high stakes. True. A 30 day supply of generic Adderall extended release was around $180 with insurance. It was 95 to hundred when I went on Medicare and qualified for extra help prescription it costs 480. Yeah. My, like my prescription of Adderall cost me 15 bucks, but it's uh time released and it's generic, not brand. Uh, I can certainly appreciate your structure and list systems. I'm the same way I left alone. I would end up restoring a house and going fishing, have the rewards from structured goals gives purpose. Agreed. What do you think about getting things done by David Allen? Is this, is his method worked for you? It works for me, but I'm not capable of maintaining those lists over long periods of time and keeping up with it. So it works for me for a while, then I kind of abandon it. And then if I go back to it, it'll work for me. So it's just like, it's one of several things that I like. Um, anything hit you like? I, I, mean, yeah. I, I, uh, I started uh, reading, uh, getting things done, but then I, I just didn't get it done. <laughs> um, this has been super valuable and thought provoking. Thank you. You're welcome, Americ. Uh, I specialize with downsizing seniors. Per perfect. That seems like it would be your age would work for you then. Red lip marketing. Focus mate is one. Uh, oh, is that like a uh, ADD uh, supplement? I don't know what's in it, so I'd have to take a look at it. Rich, check out Focus mate for the virtual co work. Oh, okay. That's one of those where you sign up and then they put you in with someone. Uh, virtual co-working app that you're looking for. I heard about it from another ADD entrepreneur. Some of you guys are reading my mail. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take a picture of that just because I do want to try that at some point. Uh, today I have Julian here, so I don't need it, but at some point I would love to leverage that. Uh, have you had any experience with using chronotypes to help find the parts of the day that best for productivity, creativity, et cetera? I haven't. Have you? No. Yeah. I've heard about that though. Uh, do you use brainwave technology sounds to get into flow? Yes, I do. I use brain, uh, brain.fm, which I have a lifetime subscription to. So sometimes I'm listening to that. And then also I use, um, the Fisher Wallace machine, which is not really for brainwaves. Um, that's really more to stimulate the vagus nerve. And it's, I use it for, uh, I bought it for depression a long time ago. Uh, it helped me get out of depression. Um, it's also good for insomnia. And so I use it for that as well. And, uh, I used to use light and sound machines as well in my hypnosis centers and used it personally quite a bit when I was younger to get myself into theta and Delta. Um, I was a natural educator for a huge company when diagnosed, once I figured out why it was hard for me to learn something new, I changed my teaching style and I'm a super effective at teaching ADD. -er. Any, uh, then tips, uh, Dale on how best to learn as an ADD person. Could you write out the drugs you've mentioned when you post this to YouTube? Thanks. Um, I won't have time to do it for the next couple of days because I'm really battling some deadlines. But the following week, I will do two live streams. And uh, one, I will go back. The two that I want to go back to are my nootropics because I didn't do as good of a job as I wanted to. And I will have a long list then. And the other one is like the exercises I do in my journal. Those two were ones that I felt like I kind of dialed it in. Uh, exactly. An entrepreneur should stick to what works for them and love themselves the way they are and focus on their strengths. Why focus on weaknesses, stress out, and live in hell? Make it easier. Totally agree, Emmy. Uh, any idea if these are safe if you have cardiovascular issues? The challenge with any stimulant is that it's more dangerous with cardiovascular issues. So I, it's something that you strongly suggest 
you talk to your doctor about. Obviously, Julian and I are not doctors, nor do we know what we're talking about from a medical standpoint. And you should never follow our advice. We're just two guys online, um, you know, and that you should definitely run anything that you're ingesting through a medical professional if you have any concerns or doubts or challenges health wise. Uh, so I note the mic is picking up his voice even when sitting behind. Just an FYI, keep feeling bad. He leans into the mic sometimes. Good to know, Davey Paul. Uh, how about Todd Herman's 90 day method? Does it work for you? I've never tried Todd. I mean, I love Todd Herman. He's a close friend of mine. I've never tried his 90 day method. Um, I'll have to ask him to share it with me and then I'll try it and I'll let you know, Hamza. Um, I'm actually talking to him, I think tomorrow or the next day. Uh, Hey, Samuel. Yeah, you are late, but that's okay. Um, It'll be here for you to watch at some point. The Power of When is a book on chronotypes. They had a quiz on their website. Oh, that's interesting as it relates to the stuff that we're working on too. Um, the power of when. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Uh, this has been really helpful. Thank you both. Cool. Well, th- and it's been two hours, believe it or not. Time went by fast. And so we will wrap it here. Thanks for everyone for joining. Um, thanks for commenting. Thanks for making this an engaging live stream. And uh, so we're not going to do Thursday. I'm got to let make sure my team knows that. But I will be here next Tuesday. So uh, stay tuned and I'll see everyone here at this time, at this place, wherever you're watching us uh, a week from today. So to higher profits and beyond, anything you want to say? No, thanks so much for having me. I just want to say, uh, well, you know this, Rich. I've been a big fan of uh, of Rich's for for a long time. He's one of the first uh, uh, business marketing geniuses that I I studied. So it's kind of cool. I guess what I'm really saying is props to me yeah for being here and for helping me at a time when i need it most and providing me some clarity on this campaign that i'm working on which is all about uh our last time selling uh steal our winner's lifetime and sell and marketing it to a bunch of people who might not have ever heard of steal our winners and so it's like how best to get people up to speed and then being willing to buy lifetime before lifetime goes away uh, so that's what we're working on. And so lots of people thanking us both. So you should see that. And, uh, thank you for the thanks and see everyone next week. Adios.